Okay, so we'll get started then. Right, so good morning, good afternoon, uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, the title of the webinar is Easy Migration from Oracle JDK to Open JDK. And really the idea behind this webinar is to talk about how you can move between different versions in terms of the binaries of the Java development kit. So really the, the Java platform. And there are a number of good reasons for why you might want to be doing this. What we'll do is we're going to start the presentation in terms of talking about um, why you want to migrate your JDK. What would be the reason for doing this? Uh, up until now, you've probably been using the Oracle JDK, you've been downloading it, you've been using the updates and so on. So why would you think about moving to a different supplier of your JDK? Why would you use a different version of it? And the answer to this is that to start with, let's go back and talk about how we used to um, Java being provided to us. And if you think about it, Java is now 20, 23 years old. And we've seen up until now 10 releases of Java. And a couple of those have come fairly quickly. But prior to that, the release cadence, the release time has been quite long. So we've had sort of two, three, four years between releases. And one of the great things about the way that the JDK has been provided to us is the amount of overlap that we get between the last release and the current release in order to be able to migrate our applications. And I did some research on this. And if you look at JDK 6, what you'll find is that when that came out, the public updates of JDK 5 continued for nearly three years after JDK 6 was released. So that meant that if you were developing an application on JDK 5 and you had it running, you had nearly three years to migrate your application to JDK 6. Lots of time to do testing, lots of time to see what was going on, lots of time to actually make that move. Let's look at JDK 7. Okay, JDK 7, you had a bit less time, but you still had over a year and a half. So one year and nine months of updates to JDK 6 after JDK 7 was released. So again, plenty of time to migrate your application. JDK 8, you had, okay, less time again, but still over a year of updates to JDK 7 once JDK 8 had been released. So this has been really good for us as developers. It means that when a new release of Java comes out, we don't have to think to ourselves, oh, right, we've got to jump immediately to that release. We've got to get all that software working, we've got to do all the testing, and as soon as that comes out, we've got to move to it straight away. The other really good thing about this is that we can also say to ourselves, right, okay, new release of Java has come out. That's got some big new features in it, especially if you look at like JDK 8 with some of the things that did. And you can say, okay, well, I'm not quite sure that I want to move straight away because there might be some things that need to be ironed out in terms of that particular JDK. Um, clearly, the developers test it very extensively but it's only once it gets into production and lots of people use it that you start to find some of the, the sort of smaller edge case things that might need to be changed. So you've got lots of time for the platform to become stable before you actually migrate to it. And certainly talking to customers, most people wait a few releases of the updates before they move to a new version of Java. So this is how things worked in the past. As of September last year, Oracle made some announcements about how things were changing. The first of those was that there's a new release model. And the idea now is that every six months, there will be a new version of the JDK. We had JDK 9 come out in September last year. And in, in March this year, we had JDK 10. In September of this year, we'll have JDK 11. So we're already seeing this faster release cadence for the JDK. And the reason for this is the developers of Java want it to be more agile. This is the kind of methodology that most people use in developing applications now, so that you can react to changes in requirements more quickly. You can get new features to develop to, from developers to users more quickly, and you get a better user experience. The way that the Java developers used to work was that they targeted the idea of a release every two years, and they never actually managed that. 
So if you look at JDK9, it was three and a half years from JDK8. If you look at JDK8, it was about three years from JDK7. So they never actually managed the two-year release thing that they wanted to. So they wanted more agile. They wanted the idea of release every six months. The way this works is by changing how features are added to Java. It used to be that when they started developing a new version of Java, they would select a set of features. And when all those features were ready, the JDK itself would be released. If things got delayed, like if you look at modularity in JDK 9, a couple of delays on that, it meant the whole JDK got de uh, delayed by a certain amount of time. Now, with this six month release cycle, only the features that are ready go into a particular release. Only the things that are there that can be put into the product go in a particular release. If something that they thought they were going to target for a particular JDK isn't ready in time, it gets delayed. So it gets moved to the next release or maybe the release after that. So only the things that are ready get put into a release. And you can guarantee that by doing it that way, you get a release every six months. As we've already seen with JDK 10, that has started working. JDK 11 is in the ramp down phase. It will come out in September. Again, the process is working very nicely. Now, related to this, Oracle also said that trying to support all of these releases, now that we were have one every six months, was going to be impractical. So they, they didn't want to do that. Trying to support long term, all of these releases just wasn't going to work. What they said was that they were going to designate particular releases as being long term support releases. And this is kind of like the, um, the Ubuntu style of doing things. What they've done is they said that JDK 8, to sort of get things started, is going to be a long term support release. After that, they're going to have one release as an LTS release every three years. In terms of how that's going to work moving forward, the next long term support release is JDK 11. That's the one in September. Related to that is the fact that public updates for JDK 8 will stop in January of next year. Now, you'd qualify that slightly because public updates of JDK 8 for commercial users will stop in January next year. If you're a desktop user who's using it at home, running Minecraft or something like that, you will still get updates until the end of 2020. The auto updater will still do that and it will still work, but for commercial users, JDK 8 support stops as of January 2019. JDK 9, JDK 10 are not long-term support releases. They're called feature releases, and that means that they only get updates for six months. We've already seen JDK 9 have two updates, and then when JDK 10 was released, updates to JDK 9 stopped. When JDK 11 comes out, updates to JDK 10 will stop as well. The other thing that Oracle have decided is that they want to broaden the number of binaries that they're producing, specifically around the way that these binaries are distributed and licensed. Up until now, if you wanted to download Java, typically you would have gone to java.oracle.com or before that, java.sun.com. And on there, you would find a number of downloads for different platforms, different versions, and so on, different updates, and you could download the binaries from there for free. Part of that involved clicking on a license, which is the Oracle binary code license for Java SE. This has some restrictions, most of which are not really too important to uh, people because they tend to be around not being able to use this for free on embedded systems. If you want to use it on a desktop, if you want to use it on a server, then the restrictions don't affect you. You can use it for free without any problems. But it is a click through license, you do have to agree to it. Since uh, really JDK 10, Oracle are also now producing a second set of binaries. And these are binaries which are built purely from the Open JDK source code. These are available through jdk.java.net. They have a different license. You don't have to click on agreeing the license, there's no restrictions um, or less restrictions than you have on the Oracle binary code license. It's a GPL v2 with class path exception license, so you don't get contamination if you're for your source code of your own application. The important thing about these binaries is that every single release will only have updates for six months. 
So this is important because from a long-term support perspective, none of these releases are long-term support. That means that until the next JDK release comes out, you get updates. After that, no updates because there's a new release. So there are two scheduled updates for each version, maybe some emergency ones in between, but typically only two updates. And the other very important thing, as we've already seen that we're the thing that we're used to, is there's no overlap of updates for previous versions. As soon as the new version comes out, updates to the old version stop at that point. There's no um, time when you can migrate um, using an older version. Now, a lot of people I've spoken to look at these bits of information and they get a little bit confused about what this really means to them. So I put this slide together to try and help eliminate the confusion about what is actually happening with Java. So I've said that there will be a long-term support release every three years. And that's what Oracle have said in terms of um, the Oracle binaries. What this does not mean is three years of free updates. So this is very important. Even though there is a long-term support release every three years, there aren't free updates for three years. One of the reasons for this is that as of JDK 11, the Oracle JDK, the binary that we're all used to using, can only be used in production with a commercial support contract from Oracle. You can still download it, you can still use it for development, you can still use it for testing, for demonstrations and, and so on, but if you want to deploy it into a commercial deployment on a data center where you're using it for applications, then you will have to use that JDK under a commercial support contract from Oracle. So there is no more free Oracle JDK from JDK 11. The fact that there is a second binary available from Oracle means that the only free JDK from JDK 11 onwards will be the open JDK binaries. So you'll be able to use those without a license under, or under the GPL v2 license with class path exception. So if you want to continue to get free updates to the JDK, then you have to update your JDK every six months. When JDK 12 comes out, you will need to upgrade to that because JDK 11 will not have any more updates. When JDK 13 comes out, you will have to move to that because JDK 12 won't have any more updates in terms of the open JDK binaries. One other thing that people get slightly confused about is that can they still use JDK 8? And the answer is yes, you can still use JDK 8, you can use JDK 7, 6, so on. No problem at all, you can use that indefinitely without any charge because that is still under the old style of license. Thing is that if you do continue to use JDK 8 or earlier, you won't get any further security patches or bug fixes. So those will stop as of January next year. And just to put this into a picture, this shows the way that the JDK update schedule works. The orange boxes show the versions which are only available under an Oracle support contract. So if you look at JDK 6 and 7, they've already been, um, they've stopped having public updates and the only way you could get commercial support was through the Oracle support contract. As I said with um, JDK 8, as of January next year, that will move to only having updates for non-commercial users. JDK 11 is a long-term support release, but only for people who have a commercial support from Oracle. If you want the free version, you have to use the open JDK version, which is the one in green at the top. And that's six month release cycle only has updates for the six months of that particular version of the JDK. So let's run a quick poll at this point. Um, always interesting to see what the audience expects. So the idea here, is say, do you, as the audience, have a plan for how you're going to deploy Java applications next year? And I've given you four options for this. First is, you're gonna continue using the existing JDK, but without updates. So if you're using JDK 8, you'll just carry on using it, but you won't care that you're not getting security patches and bug fixes. Second option is, okay, we're gonna carry on using the existing JDK, but with some form of commercial update support. Could be from Oracle, could be from Zool, could be from somebody else. Third option, we'll move to the latest JDK every six months. 
So you can carry on using it for free, but you're going to move JDK every six months. And the last option we've not decided what to do yet. So I've given you a few seconds to answer that. So if we close the poll and have a look at the results, hopefully we will see some results. I'm not seeing the results at the moment. Um, ah, there we go. Yes. Okay. So 5% say that they're going to continue using the existing JDK without updates. So that's a small number. Um, split evenly in terms of 15% say they're going to continue, they will use the existing JDK, but with commercial update support. 15% um, surprisingly are going to update their JDK every six months. And what I normally see is that the majority of people here, 64%, have not decided what they're going to do yet. So if we go back to the slides and let's talk a bit about the Oracle JDK and Open JDK, because this is quite important when we're talking about how to migrate between the two. What I what I say is that in order to think about migrating from the Oracle JDK to the Open JDK is that you need to do some pre-migration analysis. And there are a set of things that you need to consider before you do the migration. The most important of these is that you need to understand that the Oracle JDK and the Open JDK are not identical in terms of functionality. We'll explain more about that as we go through in terms of what the differences are. What you then need to do is you need to understand what those differences are and think about what impact they may have on your application. So if there's some functionality that you're using in the Oracle JDK, is there an alternative way of doing that or some alternative source of that functionality in the Open JDK that you can use to keep your application working in the way that you want it to? And then again, based on what's happening there, what features you're using and so on, which version of the JDK are you going to migrate to? Are you going to stay on the same version you're already using, but just go to the Open JDK version of that? Or are you going to go to a newer version which has different features and, and use it that way? So these are the things that you really need to consider in terms of deciding how to migrate. And to help you understand this a little bit more clearly in terms of the differences, what I've done is I've created this Venn diagram. And this is how we can perceive Java and the JDK for JDK 10 and earlier. We'll talk about what's changing in JDK 11 and later, a little bit later on. But for now, we'll just talk about the sort of the world as it is at the moment. So JDK 8, JDK 9, JDK 10. And the green circle here represents Java SE. And that's the core of the Java platform. This is what's defined by the Java community process through a specific Java specification request, and it defines the, the core functionality of the Java platform. That's the JVM, what the JVM does in terms of interpreting bytecodes, the fact that it needs a garbage collector, the fact that it needs multi-threading, all those sorts of things. Also defines all of the standard class libraries, so our Java and Java X packages. So that's, that's what you need as a minimum to be called Java. Then you have the Open JDK, and the Open JDK contains everything that is in Java SE. It does that because it is actually the reference implementation in terms of the source code for the Java SE specification. But it also includes some other things. So one of the, the sort of most obvious of these is the fact that Open JDK includes Nashorn. Nashorn is the JavaScript scripting engine, uh, not covered by the Java SE specification, but is included in the Open JDK. So that's one of the kind of key differences there. And then you have the biggest circle, which is the Oracle JDK. The Oracle JDK contains everything that's in the Open JDK because it's built on top of that source code. But then there are some other things which are added on top of that to make the functionality that Oracle provide through their binary distribution. What are the differences? OK, so I've kind of listed the, these out and we'll kind of talk through the individual parts. Um, some of them are fairly small, so let's start with fonts. Um, there are some fonts which are not part of the OpenJDK source code, but are included in the Oracle JDK. These are some commercially licensed fonts, and so because they're commercially licensed, they're not open source, so they're not part of OpenJDK. In terms of the Zulu JDK, which is Azul's build of the 
OpenJDK source code, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on, we include the same fonts as the Oracle JDK. But if you're using purely OpenJDK, there might be some fonts that are missing for a desktop or graphical application. Related to that is font rendering. Um, again, fairly small feature because what Oracle does is they change the renderer that's used within the JDK itself. They use a renderer which is called T2K. The open source version, part of the open JDK, is free time. Now, the reason they do that is purely from a um, performance perspective and from a functionality point of view, there are no differences. So we'll render fonts in exactly the same way. But it's just something to be aware of because if you're doing something at an incredibly low level with font rendering and trying to do something uh, very odd, then there might be the possibility that by using the way that Oracle does it versus the way that the OpenJDK does it, there might be some things that you would need to be aware of, but very unlikely. Oracle JDK provides some support for SNMP. So this is to do with the idea of the management of the JVM. There's some additional plugins and things that you can use to gain more information about what's happening with the, the JVM itself. This is closed source feature from Oracle, um, not available as part of the um, OpenJDK. So again, if you've been using that, you need to think to yourself, okay, how am I going to deal with this when I move to OpenJDK? And then again, a very small feature in terms of sound drivers. Wouldn't expect a lot of people to bump into this as an issue, but from the Oracle JDK perspective, they provide some drivers for Windows only, whereas the OpenJDK doesn't provide any drivers at all. So again, very small feature, probably won't cause anybody any problems. A um, couple of other things, um, as you'll see, some of these are, or most of these are related to desktop type things. So um, color matching, the Oracle JDK, um, again, replaces the OpenJDK version with a closed source, slightly different performance um, version, but functionality wise, it's the same. And then, um, graphics rasterization, this has changed a bit over the last couple of releases. What you used to get prior to JDK 9 was that the open JDK used a rasterizer called Pisces. And because that didn't have quite as good performance as Oracle wanted, they actually replaced it with a closed source version called Ductus. As of JDK 9, the open JDK switched from using Pisces to using a different open source renderer called Marlin. That has much better performance. It's pretty much the same as Ductus. So there's no real reason that um, you'll see any difference uh, from that point of view if you're moving to JDK 9 or later. Encryption, a couple of things here that you need to be aware of. So in terms of encryption strength, prior to JDK 8 update 161, which was in January of this year, the default encryption strength was 128-bit for JDK. As of um, January this year, it's now been moved up to unlimited by default. Prior to JDK 8 update 161, so if you're using an older version, there were different configuration methods between OpenJDK and the Oracle JDK as to how you configure it for unlimited um, strength encryption. But again, these are things which will really only affect you know, almost nobody. And finally, in terms of encryption, the certificate authorities files, the CA certs file. Prior to JDK 10, in OpenJDK, this file was empty. The Oracle JDK had a uh, populated CA certs file with a list of certificates from the certificate authorities uh, for the, the most commonly used ones. As of JDK 10, this information has been contributed into OpenJDK, so there's no difference um, as of JDK 10. Um, slightly bigger things around some of the uh, libraries, JarFX. If you've been using JarFX, that is provided um, with the Oracle JDK. It's not part of the OpenJDK build. This is where things get a little bit complicated because um, if you build the OpenJDK source code um, for the JDK, by default, you won't get JarFX. But JarFX is a sub-project of the OpenJDK project called OpenJFX. So that's why I say it's slightly confusing because it is part of OpenJDK, but it doesn't get built as part of OpenJDK. 
You can install it as a separate library. There's no um, difficulty with doing that. There are binary downloads available from a number of people who have been building the, the binaries of this. The most obvious of those is from a company called Gluon. They've been doing a lot of work in terms of providing JavaFX support, JavaFX binaries, and they've just recently um, been doing things around JDK 11 with JavaFX and Maven Central. So there, there are easy ways of um, getting JavaFX into your JDK. Deployment. This is probably the one that's going to catch out the most people. Um, probably won't catch out a lot of people, but the, this is the one that is going to affect most people in terms of differences between JDKs. First thing is the browser plugin. The browser plugin is not part of the Java specification. It's not open source. It's not part of the Open JDK. Most browsers don't support this anymore. So the API that was used for this, most browsers don't support it anymore. So it's very difficult to make Java run in a browser now anyway. There's a couple of places where you can still do that, but most people have switched to HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS. But if you are still using applets, if you are still using the browser plugin, you need to be aware that that is a difference between the Oracle JDK and OpenJDK. Related to that is Java Web Start. And I know that there are some people who are still using Java Web Start. Kind of combination of applets and application where you have an icon on your desktop, you click on it. If the application needs to be downloaded, it'll be downloaded. If there are any updates, those will be up updated. But if the application hasn't changed, it's just run off your disk. So it's a nice way of doing things. It's sort of um, cross between applets and applications. Even though the JNLP, the Java Network Launch Protocol, was a JSR, JSR 56, the reference implementation for that was never open sourced. So all of Java Web Start is still completely closed source. That means that there isn't an equivalent in OpenJDK of what's provided by the Oracle JDK. There are some open source alternatives. I, I had a look at this and there are a few projects, but they kind of date back quite a long way. They, they really were started when Java Web Start was a more popular way of deploying applications. And most of them have fallen into sort of um, disuse and they haven't been updated for many years. There isn't a possible alternative being developed by a company called Caracoon um, who are looking at developing this as an open source alternative implementation because um, JSR 56 is available, the, the specification is there, they could build uh, a new implementation of it without a problem. But that is something that isn't available yet. A couple of other things around tools, um, flight recorder mission control. Um, these were commercial features, are commercial features from Oracle. You could use them for free in development, but you needed to pay for a license if you wanted to use them in production. As of JDK 10, Mission control has been contributed to the OpenJDK, so those are, those differences are starting to go away. Visual VM was removed from JDK 9, um, so if you've been using Visual VM for whatever reason, there is still an open source version available. You can build it, you can install it, um, you can use it in exactly the same way. Same for Java DB. That was removed in JDK 9. It was an implementation of the Apache Derby database. You can still download the source code from there. You can still build it. You can still get binaries. So again, relatively easy to, to fix that if you've been using it. So this leads us to converged binaries. The diagram that I showed earlier was JDK 10 and earlier. What Oracle have also decided to do is to move to a situation where there will be no functional differences between the Oracle JDK and a JDK built purely from OpenJDK source code. The idea is that as of JDK 11 and later, our Venn diagram will look like this. So we still have the Java SE standard, we still have the core of the Java platform, but then the additional bits that go around that, that make up the OpenJDK, will be no different to what you will get in terms of an Oracle JDK binary. Now, the way they've done this in terms of JDK 11 is to approach it from two different directions. The first is they've said, okay, some of the parts which were closed source in the Oracle JDK prior to JDK 11 have been contributed as open source to OpenJDK. Flight recorder, that's going in JDK 11. Mission control, already in JDK 10. 
other things like application class data sharing, the CA certs file, things like that, all of those have migrated into the JDK already as part of Open JDK. So contributing some things is one direction. The other is removing things from the, J the Oracle JDK binary. Browser plugin, Java Web Start, and Java FX. All of those will no longer be part of the Oracle JDK binary as of JDK 11. So again, if you're still using something like Java Web Start, you need to think very carefully about that because moving to JDK 11, there will no longer be support for Java Web Start, either from the Oracle binary or from Open JDK. So let's talk a little bit about how we can migrate from the Oracle JDK to Open JDK. We've looked at the differences, we've understood what we need to be aware of, what do we need to do in terms of actually doing the migration? And the answer is actually very simple. Um, I put this slide together and there's literally five steps and it really is as easy as this. Firstly, you need to figure out which JDK version, which provider, which binary you're actually going to use. So are you going to use JDK 8? Are you going to use JDK 11? Are you going to use some other JDK? Once you've made that decision, you need to find somebody to provide it for you, or you need to build it yourself because that's quite possible. You could easily download the source code for OpenJDK and build a binary of that. So at some point you need to get to having a binary. Once you've got that binary, you install it on your server, on your machine, you put that binary onto your machine so that it can be used. Then, because it's Java, all you have to do is modify the Java home environment variable and the path environment variable to point at the new place for your JDK. So where the Java executable is going to be, you point at that. When you start your application up, it uses the new version of Java rather than the old one, and everything should work. As long as you're not using any of the, um, of the things which are things we've already discussed, which might cause problems, then you should see no issue at all in terms of using uh, a different version of Java. For Linux users, there's also the update alternatives command, which you can use to set up various versions of Java, and then you can switch between them for different applications if you want to. Once you've done that, clearly the most important thing to do is to test your application. I have told you that there are a few differences, but theoretically there should be no issues, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't test your application. You need to make sure that your application works in exactly the same way as it does before. Once you're happy with that, once you've identified that there are no problems with running your application on a new version of the JDK, then you can deploy it. So that, that's really it. Let's talk a little bit about Azul's Zulu Java, because if you're evaluating the idea of using OpenJDK, the important thing to remember here is OpenJDK is source code. What you need is a binary of OpenJDK. You can get it from Oracle. You can also get it from Azul. What we do is the obvious. We take the OpenJDK source code and we run it through the build scripts to generate binary distribution. Once we've done that, we run the full set of the TCK tests, the technology compatibility kit, the JCK, the Java compatibility kit, run all of those tests on the binary that we've created. In theory, we don't need to do that because we're building OpenJDK, which is the reference implementation of Java SE. So by definition, it should be what Java is. But just to make sure, we run all the tests just to make sure we didn't do anything wrong. So we guarantee that it has passed all the TCK tests. We make a number of versions available and we go quite a long way back. So we will actually go all the way back to JDK 6 at the moment. So we have JDK 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And obviously when 11 comes out, we'll support that as well. And what we do is, you know, we will actually backport fixes to those versions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. We also have wide platform support. So if you want the standard Intel 64-bit versions, we've got Windows, we've got Mac, we've got Linux. If you're still using older versions of Windows or Linux and you want a 32-bit version of the JDK, we can provide that as well. So 32-bit Windows Linux. And then for embedded applications, we have ARM 32-bit, we have PowerPC, and if you're interested in the, the sort of more enterprise side of ARM with the 64-bit processors, then again, we have builds that will run on ARM 64-bit. Um, the web address here will allow you to go and download that. It is completely free. Um, I will say that. 
What we also do is extended support. Um, so the idea of extended support is that we will take the fixes, uh, security patches, bug fixes, that are provided in the OpenJDK source code for the currently supported version, uh, which at the moment is JDK 8 and JDK 10. And we will backport those to older versions. So we'll take the, the web revs, we'll take the changes, and then we'll backport them to JDK 6 and JDK 7. And as things change in the future with JDK 12 and 13 and so on, we will take those fixes and backport them into the versions that we are going to support. So that, that is a potentially non-trivial task, as you find out when you actually start doing this work, is that there are, because there are changes between JDKs, what might be a very simple change in one version, the new, more modern version, when you try and move it back to JDK 6 or JDK 7, you find that it's actually quite a lot of work. In terms of Zulu 8, we're going to be supporting that until March 2026. So that gives you a long time to continue using JDK 8. You don't need to make any moves to newer versions. Uh, you've got um, the better part of um, eight years to continue using JDK 8 with updates being provided to that. Our goal is to use the same long-term support idea that Oracle are using. So we will match their long-term support releases, JDK 11, JDK 17, and so on. And we will support those releases for nine years of active support and two years of passive support. What that means is that for nine years, we will be backporting fixes. And then for two years after that, we will continue to offer the ability to fix problems if you still want to use it. Uh, you still come across an issue, we will um, resolve the problem and we will create a patch and then provide that to you separately. So you will still get updates for nine years um, and then two years of passive support beyond that. The other thing that we've introduced is the idea of medium term support. Idea of medium term support is that um, the, the problem with long term support, if you like, is that there's only one every three years. If there's a feature you really want to use between those long term support releases, you've got to wait quite a long time until the next long-term support for that. So a medium-term support is where we're going to support two of the releases between the long-term support releases. And the way that will work is that we will provide updates to that for 18 months after the next long-term support release comes out. So it gives you 18 months to migrate from one of the intermediate releases to the next long-term support release. Easiest way of looking at that is through a diagram because um, otherwise, it's, it's difficult to sort of explain in words. So what we've got here is like JDK 9, 10, 11, and so on. 11 is a long-term support release. So you can see that we have uh, both Oracle commercial binaries and the Azul binaries, which have long-term support for that. JDK 12 is a short-term release um, or a feature release. So it doesn't have any um, commercial support available for it from either Oracle or Azul. JDK 13 is an intermediate release. So what we will then do is we will support that. We provide updates to JDK 13 until 18 months after the next long-term support release, which in this case is JDK 17, comes out. And that gives you 18 months to migrate your application from JDK 13 to JDK 17. Or in the case of JDK 15, you've got 18 months to migrate to JDK 17. So this is the idea that we will provide more support for more releases. So to summarize, Java is changing and not just from a technical perspective. The way that you get access to Java, the way that you will have updates to Java is changing quite radically. There is this new six month release speed. So we'll be seeing more releases of Java much more quickly. Most importantly, there is no more free Oracle JDK in production as of JDK 11. If you want to continue using free Java with updates, regular updates, you're going to have to use an open JDK binary. And the open JDK binary is only going to have updates provided into the source code for six months. So you will have to move to the next version of the JDK every six months in order to continue to get free updates. As users, you need to think about this very carefully. You know, are you going to be in a position where you can move to a new JDK every six months? Are you going to have the testing cycles, testing ability to make sure that your application can move to a new JDK every six months? 
do you need longer term support? Are you going to stick with JDK 8? Are you going to move to JDK 11? All of these things need to be considered. Azul can help. So besides offering free Zulu binaries, we also have the idea of commercial support. So there's extended support available for more releases. Um, the idea is to ease the migration path between different versions of the JDK so that you don't have to jump immediately to a new version. You can take your time. You can make sure that everything works. You can do all of the testing at your own speed. We do a full support service. It's not just about um, backporting fixes and, and providing the same fixes that Oracle do. We also do bug fixing if there are things that you discover in the JDK which need to be addressed um, and they're not addressed immediately through the Open JDK itself. So with that, that's the end of the, the presentation. What I'll do now is I'll have a look to see whether we've got any questions. Um, so if I go to the question section here. Um, okay, um, right, so had, apparently we had some problem with the audio at the beginning, but that, uh, okay, the audio is now starting. Um, right, uh, question here. So develop desktops and stage test servers JDKs are not counted as number of seats under an LTS license. Um, well, I'm not going to answer. I don't think I can answer that because that would be something you'd need to discuss with Oracle. Um, so develop desktops, as I understand it, um, you can still use the LTS release um, quite happily for developers without um, having to count those. That's true. Um, testing, yeah, again, uh, as I understand it, they, they would not be counted. So um, that would be something again to check with oracle but i understand that unless it's being used in production then um you can use it for free um let's see other questions um ah, right okay uh, question here where can i read more about oral commercial support <laughs> i would suggest oracle's website um i know that they they have uh, details on their website just as we have details on our website of what we offer in terms of commercial support one thing I would say is that Oracle have changed their pricing structure fairly recently um, to make it into more of a subscription-based approach for how they charge for these things. The way that the um, cost of the, the support is, is calculated is based on number of processors. And processors is a slightly odd concept in this case because it doesn't mean the number of cores, it doesn't mean the number of sockets, it's a combination of the two. So it's, it's basically number of sockets times half the number of cores. The way that they charge for that means that if you do the, the maths and you look at a typical um, rack mounted server that you'll be using in your data center, what you'll find is that the cost of um, deploying an Oracle system compared to the Azure system, we charge about a tenth of what Oracle do in, in most cases. Uh, next question, where does OpenJ9 fit in this? Um, well, OpenJ9 is an alternative implementation of Java. So it's it's based on OpenJDK from the point of view of the libraries are the same, the tools are the same, everything except the JVM itself is the same as OpenJDK. But what IBM have done is they have created a clean room implementation of the JVM. So they've had developers who've literally taken the specification. They've not looked at the source code for the JVM as part of the Open JDK, and they've written Oracle J9 completely from scratch, just using the specification to ensure that it interprets the bytecodes in the same way. Um, it has garbage collection and so on and so forth. So Open J9 is an alternative. Um, you can get that from uh, IBM. It's now part of the Eclipse Foundation. So yes, if you wanted to use that, um, it's an alternative, but clearly it has different ways of doing certain things. So you'd need um, different configuration for things like garbage collectors and so on. Um, and so one more question here. Um, how difficult do you think it will be to, oh no, hang on. Uh, Right, okay, so did you discuss your value add in the GC space? No, so this presentation has not been about Zing, which is our commercial JVM that replaces garbage collection. Um, this is purely about Zulu, which is where we take OpenJDK source and we build that. We don't modify the JVM at all. We don't do anything um, in terms of changing the way the garbage collector works. 
Um, so go back to the question I was going to answer a moment ago. Um, how difficult would it be to move to a new JDK every six months? And the answer to that is, is obviously it depends on the application. But what you do have to understand is that there has been a, a change in the approach of the development of Java. It's not just about adding new features, it's also about removing them as well. And we've seen this in terms of um, with JDK 11. Clearly, I've, I've said things like Web Start and the browser plugin have been removed. But it's more than that. It's things like the java.se.ee meta module, which contains Corba, it contains things like um, web services for SOAP based web services, the uh, Bean activation framework, things like that. Um, that has been removed from JDK 11. So if your application is using those things, suddenly you have to figure out how to provide an alternative for those things. And Oracle have been quite clear about this, that they will potentially have breaking changes between different versions of the JDK. They've changed the way that deprecation works to make it more clear, but potentially you only get six months notice of the fact that things are being removed or changed in terms of JDK. So moving from JDK um, every six months could potentially be very difficult. Um, will the freely downloadable Zulu LTS binaries contain backboard security fixes, or is that only available to customers who purchase the support agreement? Mm. This is a good thing. So no, the, the backboard security fixes and, and, and patches will be available through the free Zulu binaries. But what we have to say here is that um, if you are looking for some form of service level where you want to be able to get access to these patches as soon as they come out, um, then the commercial support contract is what you need. Because although we will make these available freely, we won't guarantee when, uh, at what speed, we will be making them available through um, our website. So we're not trying to, you know, um, <laughs> We're not trying to make things bad for people, but um, we can't guarantee when those free binaries will be made available. And it could be some time between when the patches are, are produced and when the free binaries get those um, bug fixes. Uh, so with that, um, that seems to be all the questions that I have there at the moment. So I'm going to say that we will end the webinar here and thank you very much.